Wow, we have actually reached the final part of this retrospective. We are covering the final 10 Muppets on the list, but please stay afterwards for some shoutouts to Muppets who didn't quite make my video proper. Number 41, Roxy Marie, performed by Fran Brill. Roxy was a smart little girl from Brooklyn with an accent to match. She appeared roughly from 1992 to 1999. A little older than some of the other Muppets, she's in fifth grade, she often appeared in a mentor sort of role to Elmo specifically, who always wanted to help her, despite her insisting that he just get in the way. Roxy's main interest was bugs. She has been seen on Sesame Street trying to train a pet butterfly or searching for the elusive doozy bug, often with Elmo right by her side, whether she wanted his help or not. Roxy Marie was Biff's niece, and Biff often tried to bestow his wisdom upon her. Roxy, however, was a bit smarter than Biff and appeared to know it, but she was always nice and patient with her well-meaning uncle. I have to say, watching these Roxy sketches made me realize that if I was a child growing up on Sesame Street, oh, if only, I'd probably have hung out with her a lot. She seemed pretty cool in an endearingly dorky sort of way. Number 42. Ruby, performed by Camille Benora. Ruby is a fun little character, and she's kind of like Meryl Sheep from the previous video that I did, in that I didn't know too much about her going in, but found myself charmed very quickly. It's probably no coincidence that they're both performed by Camille Benora, who did a great job with the character. Appearing from the late 80s to the early 90s, Ruby was a creative monster who loved to experiment and see the world in different ways. Our experiment? What experiment? The experiment I just thought of! Her experiments included seeing if she would feel less hungry after eating an imaginary hot dog, and blindfolding herself to experience how the world would be if she were blind. If there was one human Ruby was closest to, it was Gina. Gina often had a big sister role to the Muppets in her early days on Sesame Street, but it was nowhere truer than with Ruby, who greatly admired Gina and wanted to be just like her. Flattered as she was, Gina preferred Ruby to be just the way she was already. I want you to learn this song, okay? And then I want you to sing it. Sing it just like you? No, Ruby, sing it just like you. Oh. Listen. The only time I ever saw Ruby on the show as a kid was in a spoof of Guys and Dolls, which was a nice little song against gender stereotypes about how guys can play with dolls and girls can play with toy trucks. Harry Monster had a doll and Ruby had the truck. It was odd that she took the truck to bed with her at the end. That can't be comfortable. But... To each their own. Number 43, Sam the Robot, performed by Jerry Nelson. Also known as Sam the Machine, this super automatic machine first appeared on Sesame Street in 1972, mistakenly thinking he had come to Mulberry Street. When Gordon and Susan tried to tell him he was wrong, he explained that he was a perfect machine, incapable of making mistakes. Sam had a tendency to start skipping like a record, often repeating the same few words again and again, before someone would smack him Fonzie-style and fix him. I've seen this joke used with the Muppets before, and it's a cute gag, but I imagine that it wouldn't last today with kids probably trying it at home in a similar way to Don Music's piano banging. There are only a few Sam sketches online, but there are plenty of descriptions of other scenes on Muppet Wiki, where Sam would often try to learn or mimic a human concept, only to get confused. One sketch that is on YouTube has Sam falling head over heels with Gordon's toaster that Louise is fixing. He learns first about love, and then about heartbreak, when Gordon comes back for the toaster. Okay, man. Oh, wait! What's wrong? Why are you taking her away? You are already married to Susan. What's with him, man? Huh? He's got a crush on your toaster. Hey, hey, Sam, I'm not gonna marry the toaster, man. I'm just gonna take it home and toast my bread, you know? <laughs> come by and visit him when you get ready. How's that? Right. Oh, yes, I'll bring her some pumpernickel. Sam's most interesting appearance wasn't on Sesame Street at all, but rather in a Marvel comic. To backtrack a bit, the Children's Television Workshop had another show, The Electric Company, premiere in 1971, which was aimed at educating a slightly older audience, particularly in reading. In 1974, a segment was introduced called Spidey Super Stories, where Spider-Man would fight new villains and speak only in comic book speech bubbles, encouraging kids to read what he was saying. A comic series was spawned as well, with easier-to-digest stories for kids. A 1978 issue of the comic was called Star Jaws, cashing in on both the then-recent Star Wars and Jaws. In the story, Sam the Machine is hanging out with the Marvel heroine Moondragon, for some reason, when Dr. Victor Von Doom himself appears and captures them. Sam smacks one of the henchmen with his wheel and escapes to Earth to get help from Spidey. 
Doctor Doom's plan is apparently to use his giant Death Star-looking device to actually eat the Earth. God admire Doom for thinking big. Of course, Spidey and his ragtag band of misfits are able to save the day. Incidentally, on the off chance that James Gunn is watching this, why not add Sam the Robot to the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie? You got Howard the Duck, this shouldn't be that much of a stretch. Sam the Robot stopped appearing around 1979, and unlike other characters where I've just had to speculate that the writers didn't know what to do with them, this time we have actual confirmation from a Norman Stiles interview that this was the reason Sam left. Nonetheless, references to Sam still pop up over the years, including a drawing in a remix video and a CGI character in a Sesame Street Christmas Carol. Technology continues to grow and change quickly today, and Sam was pretty outdated when he first appeared. Still, references to this retro robot will always be appreciated. Number 44. Shelly the Turtle, performed by Martin P. Robinson. Shelly was a shy, slow-moving turtle, as most turtles are. He first appeared in 1986 looking for a home, only to be told by Oscar of all people that he carried his own home, his shell, with him the whole time. Other Shelly appearances included him sort of running a marathon, in his own endearing way, and singing the song I Get There, as he slowly makes his way through the world. Shelly's puppet was used twice more as two other turtles, Jiffy and Seymour. Jiffy was a patron at Hooper's store once, who made Shelly look incredibly fast by comparison. His scenes actually remind me a lot of the scenes with the sloths of the DMV from Zootopia. Van... Pan... Cakes. Pancakes! Okay, which is it gonna be? Eggs or pancakes? Seymour was a turtle who wandered into Big Bird's nest area. Big Bird wanted to keep him as a pet, but he wandered off again, leaving Big Bird more than a little depressed. And like Seymour and so many other Muppets on this list, Shelley also just stopped appearing one day. Well, I don't know if there are a lot of huge Shelley fans out there, he was pretty darn cute. The puppet sometimes gets used for other generic turtles now, but with different voices. Good to see them getting all the mileage they can with that turtle puppet. It's slow, but steady. Number 45. Sherlock Hemlock, performed by Jerry Nelson. This bumbling detective first appeared in 1970, and spent decades attempting to solve mysteries for others, with varying results. Usually, someone would solve the case for him, and he would take the credit. Still, it was hard to be that annoyed Sherlock due to how fun the character was. Sherlock would sometimes be oblivious to the clues in front of him, or he would sometimes suspect the entirely wrong thing. Of course, this was so the kids watching at home could solve the case before him. I think the one case I found that he solved by himself was when he was investigating who stepped on his newspaper. It appeared that none of the culprit's feet matched the footprint until it was revealed that it was Gladys Takao who was to blame. She was wearing tap shoes. Sherlock's ancestor, however, was a bit more competent. In a series of sketches called Caveman Days, Sherlock played the royal smart person who invented things for the king of the cavemen played by Ernie. These inventions included the toothbrush, paper, and an exit sign. Sherlock Hemlock has also had his own recurring sketch called Mysterious Theater, but we'll get to that one a bit later on the list. Sherlock's last speaking cameo on the street came in 2010, when he was waiting at Hooper's store. And who should appear near him but his performer, Jerry Nelson? While he might not be the world's greatest detective that he wanted to be, we'll still always love Sherlock. And when he announces that he solved the case we just saw for him, we'll roll our eyes and politely nod. As always. Number 46, Simon Soundman, performed by Jerry Nelson. Simon's last name wasn't Soundman for no reason. Or was it a nickname? Who knows? He had a gift of mimicry for any sound that a human could not normally make. He's hard to describe in words, so here's a quick clip of him attempting to buy a saw from a tool store. I would like to buy a... Uh -huh. A lot of his sketches were set up so the kids watching could guess what Simon was trying to say. In true Sesame Street fashion, it sometimes took the characters a while to figure out exactly what Simon wanted. It was sometimes a little unclear how much Simon could control his unique sound abilities. You would assume it's mostly involuntary, since his manner of speaking often makes things take three times as long. When Ernie imitated him once, he got offended and left in a huff. On the other hand, when Bert expressed admiration and wanted to know how Simon made such wonderful sounds, specifically the sound of a tuba, Simon did try to teach him. 
If Simon Soundman looks familiar, he was made from the same generic model as Mr. Johnson, Grover's unfortunate customer. One sketch even implied that the two were related, when Simon mentions having a brother who frequents Charlie's restaurant. While Mr. Johnson still appears sometimes today, Simon Soundman just didn't make the... <laughs> Number 47, Sunny Friendly, originally performed by Richard Hunt. People often think of Ernie as being something of a troll to Bert, constantly bothering him and never really giving him peace. However, there have also been countless moments with the duo that show their best friends for a reason, and Ernie's pestering Bert is done from a place of love, if not innocent insensitivity. But if you were to look for the biggest troll on Sesame Street, other than Harvey Kneeslapper, of course, i direct you to a certain game show host. Sonny Friendly, the Pat Sajak-style host of countless Sesame Street game shows, was presumably introduced in 1986 in case Jim Henson wasn't able to perform his own host character, Guy Smiley. Henson had become increasingly busy with other projects, and couldn't always be around on Sesame Street. Sonny Friendly took Guy's place for the most part from 1986 to 2000. So where does the trolling part come in? Well, Sonny Friendly may have lived up to his name when it came to how affable he was, but his games felt more like he was messing with people for his own amusement, especially when the prizes were hand out. One episode had him host the Sandwich Game, where Telly had to put together a sandwich. The prize? He got to eat the sandwich. Similarly, he once hosted a game called What's Prairie's Problem, where he came out of nowhere one day and asked everyone to guess what was bugging Prairie. In the end, Prairie guessed right. It was Sunny's annoying game show that was bothering her. Her prize was a trip to Sesame Street, where she, of course, already was. Maria usually had it the worst. Once she was duped into playing a few rounds of Sunny's games and was stuck with a nasty consolation prize, a chicken and a sheep that wouldn't leave her alone. Eventually, she played another one of Sunny's games just for a chance to get rid of the prizes. Out of everyone, Maria typically saw through Sunny the most and dreaded whenever he popped up to play another game. When I was on the Sunny Friendly Show, I got water dumped on my head. <laughs> Think that's funny? No. In 1992, after Richard Hunt's passing, Sonny was taken over by David Rudman. Sonny Friendly stopped appearing in 2000, but I have no doubt Maria has had some restless nights, wondering when he'll return with his adoring, invisible audience that may or may not exist. Number 48, Tough Eddie, originally performed by Jerry Nelson. Tough Eddie lived up to his name in the sense that he was definitely tough. But, as Harry Monster taught us, being tough does not equal being a bad guy. In his three appearances, Tough Eddie proved that he had a nicer side underneath his gruff demeanor. I can't find footage of his first appearance, but apparently had to do with him leaving bricks on Oscar's trash can, and Oscar grouchily telling Eddie to move them. Eddie goes to deliver the bricks, but tells Oscar he'll be back later. Suddenly worried for his safety, Oscar asks his friends to wait with him. While Muppet Wiki doesn't detail the thrilling conclusion, I can only guess Eddie was going to apologize. In his next appearance, Tough Eddie accidentally knocked over Bert's sandcastle at the beach, and an overzealous Ernie rushed to Bert's defense. While it looked like Eddie was ready to fight Bert, he instead bought Bert an ice cream cone to apologize. In his final known appearance, Tough Eddie was reformed by Richard Hunt as opposed to Jerry Nelson, and he had to be coaxed by Gordon into letting a new kid play with him and Telly. Tough Eddie was one of those characters who they could use more of if they were willing to change the formula of his appearances. After all, the punchline to his sketches were pretty much the same, and if they kept using the same setup and gag, then there wouldn't be anything funny about it. Still, I would have liked to see more of this rough around the edges character. He made a nice contrast to the rest of the cast. Number 49, Vincent Twice, Vincent Twice, performed by Martin P. Robinson. Around 1989, a new sketch debuted on Sesame Street called Mysterious Theater. It was a parody of the series Mystery, which also aired on PBS, starting in 1980. In 1981, Vincent Price began hosting the show, and around the time he retired in 89, Vincent twice began spoofing him for the kids, and perhaps also for their parents. Vincent Price most likely didn't mind, as he had acted alongside Kermit and Friends before in an early episode of The Muppet Show. With Mysterious Theater, they went all out in their parody, even spoofing the title sequence by illustrator Edward Gorey. In fact, it wasn't really a spoof, they pretty much just copied a shot of a woman in black casually sipping wine by a gravestone. I was always excited when this came on as a kid, because these sketches were generally moodier and somewhat creepier than your average Sesame Street outing. I found that when I was younger, I liked seeing the show take the occasional darker turn, like in the special Don't Eat the Pictures. Maybe it was just me. Vincent Twice would introduce the stories, where Sherlock Hemlock and his dog Watson would attempt to solve a case, usually set in the UK. Twice himself appeared once in the story itself, 
having stolen some food. I suppose we really needed him that time. Without him stealing, there'd be no story in the first place. While Vincent Twice didn't last terribly long, he will certainly be missed, spookiness and all. Number 50, Zostik, performed by Joey Mazzarino. We have reached number 50, and he's a villain. A villain on Sesame Street? That's practically unheard of. Well, sure, we've had grouchy characters, mischievous characters, even angry characters, but rarely evil characters. Granted, in some of the movies and specials, there have been flat-out villains, but they are far in between, and most of them are played by human actors. Zostik was the antagonist of a Power Rangers spoof in 1996 called Super Morphin Mega Monsters. From the planet Enormous, he would watch videos of kids playing and send his underlings to cause trouble. Pretty much just because. He would inspire kids to litter, argue over toys, and worst of all, he once had two blue monsters exclude a yellow monster, Mary Monster, because of her different fur color. Inspiring prejudice in children? That's pretty evil. Luckily for Earth, the combined efforts of Elmo Saurus, Zoe Ceratops, Teledactyl, and Rosita Raptor always set things right. After a few tries of causing trouble on Earth, Sostic appeared to give up. Perhaps after seeing the Tickle Me Elmo sales records, he realized that these Muppet monsters were juggernauts too big to fight. We'll get them next time. <laughs> Why aren't you laughing? <laughs> Well, that about covers my list of 50 retired Sesame Street Muppets. I'm glad I made it in time for the show's actual anniversary, which is on November 10th. But as promised, here are some runners-up that didn't quite make the list proper, although maybe a few of them should have in hindsight. I had a lot of people asking me about Barkley the Dog, Guy Smiley, and the Amazing Mumford. I'm happy to see so many people love and remember these great characters, but from what I've read on Muppet Wiki, they have appeared somewhat recently, to varying degrees, but more than just cameos. I will also attest that Guy Smiley's Beat the Time sketch with Cookie Monster is probably one of my favorite Sesame Street moments. Then there's Aristotle, a blind monster who liked collecting things and helping others. He only appeared from 1981 to 1983. Bip Bip was a hippie who sang scat-style numbers including the first puppet performance of Manamana. Ferlinghetti Donizetti was a beatnik poet who appeared around the same time, until 1986, to teach kids about rhyming. Mr. Chatterley hosted the show Alphabet Chat, where he attempted to teach kids about certain letters, before the show inevitably devolved into chaos. Irvine the Grouch was Oscar's niece, who appeared mostly from 1979 to 1999. I considered including her with Ernestine and Brad, but in complete honesty, I wasn't a huge fan of this character, so I chose to omit her. On that note, Oscar's girlfriend Grungetta was brought up a few times, but she's actually been on the show somewhat recently as well. She taught me that grouch romance is a confusing thing indeed. There was a little monster girl named Lulu who a few people mentioned. She appeared mostly in the early 2000s and was often hesitant to try something new. She's probably most notable for having three distinct character designs over the span of only three or four years. Wolfgang the Seal almost made the list but I think he had a somewhat major appearance just recently enough that he didn't quite meet the criteria. Which is too bad, because I love seals. I got a few asks about a mysterious character named Limbo, also known as Face or Nobody, who counted to 10 in a trippy little segment. And while he does have a cool background appearing in some old Jim Henson routines, he didn't appear enough on Sesame Street to count for my list. Kermit the Frog got brought up in the comments a lot, which I understand, but I wanted to focus on characters people wouldn't necessarily know much about. Kermit is arguably the most famous, well-known Muppet there is, barring Miss Piggy, of course, and while it's true that he's technically a retired Sesame Street character due to copyright issues, I didn't think he really needed to be on this list. If your favorite character didn't make this list, I'm sorry. It wasn't really a countdown, anyway. I wasn't ranking them or anything. I hope that even if you think I missed some good characters, you are able to enjoy this video and have fun reminiscing about classic Sesame Street. As I said in the first part, even if Sesame Street isn't really like it was when we were kids, the fact that it's still going today, still teaching kids important lessons, teaching them to be potentially better people than some adults in today's society, well that's an admirable thing indeed. Happy 50th birthday, Sesame Street. Thanks for everything.
That's a wonderful story, sir. I'm glad to hear it. Thank, thank you for thank coming you, by. Thank you for listening. It's really helped telling it again. <laughs> <laughs>